George Barna is well known to so many of you, and those of you who don't know him, you're going to get to know him over these next couple of days. Uh, yesterday, we talked with uh, George about uh, how he does his research. He has become really um, a standard out there uh, with, in my view, such names as, as Gallup and, and others, J.D. Power, who, who really have done the work in an integral way uh, to tell you what's going on in our world, and especially as it relates to what we're doing, uh, the world of, uh, of faith. He's written a new book called Futurecast, What Today's Trends Mean for Tomorrow's World. And we're gonna spend the next couple of days uh, just talking about some of the things that emerge uh, from his thoughts in this book. George, um, you, you mentioned uh, in your introduction, and I, uh, we, 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 we re referred to it just quickly yesterday, but um, I, I would just like you to expand on it a bit. Uh, where is it? Uh, you talk about information. Uh, I highlighted here somewhere, but you can't you can't make uh, smart decisions if you don't have good info. Is the point you're basically making? Yeah. It, was this a driving motivation for you in terms of the Barna Research Group over the last 30 years? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, when I first got into this, I, I looked at the church world, and I was coming out of the political world, yeah. where pretty much everything we did was driven by research. You know, candidate speeches were driven by research. Public policy was driven by research. Everything, research, research. So I became a Christian while I was in graduate school, got out of graduate school, began working in ministry circles uh, after having worked in, in consumer research for a few years. And I asked pastors and other people in uh, parachurch ministries, uh, so what databases do you go to? And they'd look at me with this blank look, say, like, what do you mean? So, well, you know, what research studies are you referring to? And sometimes they would say, well, you know, Gallup tells us this, but the Gallup people don't really focus primarily on, on faith matters. Uh, I said, but how do you make decisions? I said, well, you know, we, we kind of get a feel for it from watching our people. I said, really? And, and that's it? Mm. So, you know, I spent a lot of time praying about that and thinking, just that doesn't seem adequate. So felt as if it, there was really a need within the church market to try to provide this kind of more reliable, consistent source of information that was objective, not subjective, and that could be analyzed from a more, uh, from a broader context to give a, a better sense of not just where are we, but where are we going? And based on that trajectory, what kind of strategic decisions should we be making today? So we wanted it to be done in bite-sized pieces, because I know that when I'm working with pastors, they don't have training in quantitative methods and statistical analysis. So we've got to break it down into bite-sized pieces that they can understand, and it's got to be practical. Kind of the life question for me is, so what? Mm -hmm. It's like 67% believe this, 33% do that, 18% gave that, so what? What difference does that make? Should it be different? Why? You know, so what is, is the driving question behind everything? Well, something that occurs to me here, especially as I was reading your book, when you say uh, early on in the book, roughly two thirds of the nation's people are changing their minds, that you have shifting ground on which to base a survey, even with the f best integrity. Uh, Friedman in his book, The Alexis and the Olive Tree a few years ago, uh, said it, it's almost impossible in, the day, in, in these days of what he calls the Evernet, you know, the, the internet's everywhere, mm -hmm. <laughs> he calls it the Evernet, uh, to make even a five, week plan, let alone a five year plan, because opinions are changing all of the time. Which raises the question, when you do a survey, you're getting a snapshot. Right. Uh, how often do you have to go back and take another snapshot? Uh, frankly, it depends on what it is that you're measuring. Yeah. If you're measuring consumer taste, you better be doing it every few months. Yeah. If you're measuring something like people's religious faith, their beliefs don't change dramatically very often. They do change. But what we typically recommend is every three to five years, you've got to be taking a new pulse of, of your marketplace because their perspectives change. Even if their beliefs don't change, the context within which they hold those beliefs has changed sufficiently so that the way that they apply what they believe may be changing. And ultimately, if it's behavior that we care about the most, which it is, I mean, Jesus said, you know, show me the fruit didn't say show me what you believe, I mean, even Satan, you know, believes. gets some of this, yeah. you know, but his belief, his behavior is, is what's different. So you got to look at the behavior and that's what we say, yeah, you need to be regularly tracking that. And so when we work with clients, we encourage them, yeah, it's great that you do a study this year. We'd suggest that you put into your financial and management plans a long-term process where every three years you're budgeting 
to do a checkup to see what's changed, how much has it changed, what difference does it make in what's changed, so that you can be making better plans. Now, it seems to me that for a pastor, and I, I really relate to the studies you've done on the church over the years, because I'm a pastor, have been a pastor, um, I really wonder how many pastors are Don Quixotes out there tilting at windmills. They think they know what their people think. They think they know where their people are. Uh, for instance, take moral issues. You know, mm -hmm. sexual morality, for instance. Uh, all the studies you're doing uh, is demonstrating powerfully that there's really no difference between the people in the pew and the people outside of the church in terms of uh, sexual values. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yet, the, the, the kind of the, a pastor will preach about uh, sexual morality and talk about them, you know, not about us. Um, what, what, what are pastors saying to you when they find out that they're dealing basically with a cross-section of the world right there in their congregation? You know, there are a couple of things that come to mind. One is, uh, I started this practice where when we'll do con congregational surveys, where we'll go in and we'll do a survey among the people who attend a church to help the leaders of the church understand what people are thinking, what they believe, what they do, what they need. I I I've started this thing now where I ask the leaders to fill out the survey based on what they think the results are gonna be mm. when they come back in. And that way, when I bring the actual results in, they can't say, oh, yeah, well, I already knew that. We'll go back and take a look at what they say they thought it was going to be. We'll see the big gap, and we'll say, okay, now this is important for you to remember. Because you thought they were one way, you've developed your ministry based on those assumptions. The assumptions were wrong. So now, based on the hard data, we've got to rethink how it is that we're doing ministry. We no longer have any excuse for just continuing on the same path. The other thing that's fascinating is we did a study a few years back where I kept hearing pastors say, but I taught on that, I taught on that, I taught on that. So I went back and did a big nationwide study trying to figure out what impact the sermons have. And what we discovered is that within two hours of having been in a church service, the average individual can't identify not the three main points of the sermon, they can't identify what the topic of the sermon was. And so, you know, what I've been saying is, look, it's great to preach, you know, and, and various people pick up various things from it, but you can't put all your eggs in that basket. That's not how most people learn. And so even there, we need to be rethinking, is that the best way to get the truths of Scripture into people's minds, hearts, and lives? Do you have any suggestions as to what's the best way? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, as we've researched that, what we found is so much of what actually works well is when you're interacting with people, you're spending time with people who are applying their beliefs in a very real way. And if I watch you and I trust you and I see you do something that's taking a scriptural passage, taking a, a scriptural principle, and it's making it real in a situation a, in a way that I haven't done, I take notice of that and I think, huh, that's interesting. I kind of like that. I bet I could do that. And so if I spend enough time with you and I see you doing these things, I begin to imitate that behavior, which is the very same way that Jesus taught his disciples. Mm. He didn't spend all his time preaching at them. He said, come on, come with me. Let, let's talk with some poor people. Let's feed some poor people. Let's, let, let's go baptize. Uh, whatever it was, it was like, come and be with me. Do it with me. Watch how I do it. When I'm gone, I expect you to do this. And I think that's what we're finding to be the most powerful model is the example of your life rubbing off onto other people. Now, is that something that can be done in what's popularly referred to as a megachurch setting? Uh, perhaps it could be. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen it. Well, have you done any research on uh, why people go to large churches? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah what, what, yeah. what have you discovered? Well, there are no, uh, you know, people go for a wide range of reasons. Yeah. Sometimes it's because their friends go there. Sometimes it's because it's the hot church in town of the moment. Sometimes it's because they have a great preacher, and that's why the church, you know, attracted a, a number of people. Uh, sometimes they like to go because they want to be anonymous. They don't want, you know, people paying attention to them and having great expectations. And they, they need a time where they can kind of get some equilibrium in their life because they've been through some tough stuff. They're trying to figure it out. So, I mean, there are all kinds of reasons. The, 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 the biggest difficulty, I think, for a megachurch is to get past all that to the point where, as a leader of a large church, and, and I've been a, a teaching pastor in a, in a megachurch, and, and I've also been a pastor of, of small churches, uh, the, the, the toughest thing is to know what do you measure? 
what do you look for? And I wrote a book called Maximum Faith, where I really uh, was trying to answer the question, are people's lives still being transformed? Because if they are, we don't see it. Why isn't that happening? And by the way, I've got a copy of Maximum Faith, Live Like Jesus, Experience Genuine Transformation. There, there, there it is, friends. And this is your latest book, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, also published by Barna. <laughs> And uh, you'll be seeing that uh, on your bookstore shelves, I expect, at some point. Yeah, it just came into Canada. Just came into Canada. Yeah. Um, we also are broadcasting in the U.S., so you know yeah. you can find it there. But uh, when when you when you talk about maximum faith, I mean, see the the assumption, and you in, in Futurecast you deal with this. The assumption is that if you are attending a, a church function two or three times a week. Uh, and you're there on Sundays, of course, and um, maybe Sunday school, whatever, that um, you're pretty much maxing out what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Right. You're saying not necessarily so. Well, what I'm saying is it depends on your metrics. Mm. You know, I went back to Scripture and tried to figure out what's Jesus looking for. Mm. And I couldn't find any place in the Bible where it says, you know what, you are a devoted follower of mine if you go to church four times a month. You're a devoted follower of mine if you go to Sunday school every week. You're a devoted follower of mine if you do this, that, and anything. I mean, what he was really looking for was fruit in a person's life. And so I went back and tried to figure out, so what does he think the end point of all this is? And I think it's in, in Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31, where one of his critics actually asked him the question, so what's most important? And he said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, mind and strength, and love your neighbor in the same way. So it's all about love, complete love. Mm -hmm. All right, so how's that working out for the church? You know, and went back and I looked at, well, how many churches are measuring how loving people are becoming? Are we becoming more Christ-like? Found that I couldn't, well, truthfully, I couldn't find any. What I found is that churches tend to measure five different things. Attendance, number of programs, number of staff, uh, square footage, did I say budget? No. Amount of money raised? Yeah, those five things. And, and the assumption is we do it on a 52-week cycle. If those numbers are bigger this week than they were 52 weeks ago, we're a quote-unquote healthy and growing church. No. And the problem is Jesus didn't die on the cross for any of those five things. So my contention is we're measuring the wrong stuff. When I did the research for, for Maximum Faith, all about how are people's lives transformed, what I discovered is there, there's basically a 10-stop journey that we can go on. And, and the endpoints are where you have this, this profound love relationship with God, and through that you're then able to love other people. That's the endpoint, and less than 1% of Americans ever get to that place. So, you know, in, in fact, less than 10% uh, of Americans ever get to the second half of that 10-stop journey. So my contention in the book is, you know what, all this stuff that we're doing is well and good, but it's not really leading people to the place where I think Jesus was. Is love going. an endpoint or is it an entry point? Well, it, it's an entry point to get us onto that journey. Yeah. And, and then the idea is, yes, as we're supposed to imitate Christ, as we're supposed to understand what his life and his principles are all about, we begin to embrace more and more of that. But we've got obstacles in our life. Part of the journey is recognizing that, you know, we're so beholden to sin, self, and society that frequently we can't get to the point of loving others. We're so stuck on trying to love ourselves that we never get anywhere else. You talk about imitating Christ. Did you ever read The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. There's a lot to learn from some of these, these older authors. In, in fact, much of what I gained in, in trying to prepare to understand right. all of this was, you know, uh, John of the Cross and Francis of Assisi yeah. and yeah. Uh, Brother Lawrence and yeah. all these guys who got it through the hardships that they had in their life. And one of the things that I found is that you don't become a real dynamic Christ imitator until you suffer, yeah. until you allow crises and the pain of those crises to break you. That's the missing ingredient is brokenness. I'm glad we got another day with George Barna. Uh, the book we're making available to you is this one, Futurecast, uh, What Today's Trends Mean for Tomorrow's World, put up on the screen with the coordinates. There you go, 1-800-265-3100 or crossroads.ca, you're going to want your copy of Futurecast. I mean, George Barnett doesn't come by here every day, and he is uh, one of the most trusted voices in all of the Christian world. And to have this book available for you, friends, in this limited qu uh, quantity is really a special thing, and we hope that you will call in or log on. And remember your best ministry gift, friends, because we, 
work together, don't we, to make this thing happen. Thanks, George. See you tomorrow. Thanks, Gene. Back with more after this.